This is October 5th, 2011. We're doing an oral history interview for the archives at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. I'm Charles Lundquist, and our guest today is Sandra Sherman McCandless. We're delighted to have you with us today, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would like eventually to concentrate on your relationships or interactions with Rudolf Herman, but first, just for the record, let's get a few of the vital statistics down where where you're from, how you got to UAH, and mm -hmm. that sort of history. Okay. I was born in Decatur, Alabama, <clears throat> and except for a stint in uh, teaching in Germany, I've lived there all my life. Um, I got a chance to um, go back to school. I was a history teacher. But there weren't any jobs after the Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. So they were, the baby boom just crowded out the field. So I came back to UAH to get a degree in environmental science, and you had to have a physics course for that. So I chose to take astronomy because it had always interested me. And I, <clears throat> that's how I met Dr. Dr. Herman. And uh, then uh, I got a chance to teach here, and I enjoyed that. So I taught here in the history department for a while. And during that time, I was working at Intergraph. What years library. were those? Um, I came back to school here in the late 70s. And then I taught here in the early 80s. And uh, then when I went to Intergraph, I had to stop teaching. It was just the workload was so heavy that I couldn't teach. And so I was a librarian there. And a librarian in Decatur before that, and a librarian at, at Intergraph, and I'm a librarian again back at Decatur. Got laid off when I was 55 and couldn't find a job for two years and began to pray about it. And I wound up back in my own home library as the director. It worked out beautifully, and I loved the job. See, the library in Decatur is now a combined library with the, the city and the Former regional library, is that right? No, the regional library disbanded. Oh, I see. That's, That's what, what it is. So it's now Decatur Public Library, standalone library. All right. Okay, I was a little confused on that. Mm -hmm. And I still live in Decatur. Well, very good. Well, while you were taking the course in astronomy, you got to know <coughs> Professor Herman. Yes. Uh, later, you helped him develop a memoir. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, we got to be friends. I enjoyed his class. He was crazy about astronomy. I mean, really in love with the subject. And he tried to get all of us to join the Von Von Astronomical Society, and I did. And even though I was a historian by training, he, you know, wouldn't let me feel like I didn't belong. He made sure. He says, we need historians, too. He said, you know, you can't let that stop you. Go ahead. And so I did join, and we worked there together a lot. And I enjoyed, you know, getting to know him better and better. And one day I said, would you be interested in doing some oral history with me? And when I explained to him what that would involve, he said, like my memoirs. And I said, yes, yes, like that. And he said that that would be fine. He would do that. And he began setting aside... Saturday mornings to lunch from like about 10 o'clock through lunch to uh, sit and talk about his life. And I was fascinated. I really enjoyed hearing the stories. Did you record them or just take notes? I recorded them. Uh, unfortunately, we turned it off for lunch, and then he would tell me even more stuff. And I should have gone back and turned it back on. Or I should have made notes. I remember some of the things because they were important. <clears throat> so he saved the cherries for lunch then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's good. But um, he was so interested in astronomy. I mean, he's been as a child. He, he wanted to, to be in astronomy. And his fondest wish was to get off of this earth and look back. He didn't get to do that, but I took him a book. There was nothing but pictures of that, and we had fun looking at it together. But he realized a lot of his dream just making sure we got off 
the planet. But you got all these recordings of his conversation. What did you mm -hmm. do with them? What? What did you do with all? Oh, of them? as soon as I got the recordings, I began transcribing them, ah. which was a tedious process. Surely, and is. I did transcribe them pretty much word for word. I went back and looked at it and tightened a few things up where it was kind of a repeat of what we just said, and I gave it to him, <clears throat> and he was horrified <laughs> because he said, oh, you know, we don't want this in there, we don't want this in I was sick. He wanted to take out everything. And uh, so I told him, okay, it's your memoir. You take this paper at papers and you mark through everything you want gone. I mean, I'd even recorded his habit of saying, nah, yeah. He, he did that all the time, and I left that in there because it was an agreement kind of thing. He would nod and say, no, yeah. Um, so anyway, he did it, and I kept my original, and then I made him a copy the way he wanted it to. But being a historian, I just couldn't destroy the original. So what you have, what you should have is the original, my copy, not his. Well, the copy we have here, I believe, is the one that he distributed to everybody. Oh, would, oh would. so you need the other one. Yeah. Oh, okay, I can do that. We can have well, that one. The copies we have, I got one from him, and mm -hmm. many other people got copies from him, and that's mm -hmm. what we have here. Oh, oh no, you need the you need the originals. All right, well, we, we have the edited uh, official copy from yes, him, and then that's, we'll, that's we'll the have the originals, one. too. Well, he just very... didn't think people would be interested in a lot of this stuff. But ah. I'm interested in the person as a historian. I'm not just interested in everything he accomplished, but what made him the man that he was. So, um, did you get the original recordings? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're going to need those, too. Yeah, I guess All so, right. yes. Yes, because that's got everything in it that uh, that we talked, and there's hours of them. Oh, really? Well, mm -hmm. this is a real treasure trove then on, yeah. on him. Uh -huh. And I will find the photographs. I got a chance to um, use one of those cameras that you take pictures. Back then we didn't have scanners, so I yeah. took pictures of his pictures, and, and they came out pretty good. So I've got to get those together for you because okay. I've just held on to them because I wasn't sure. I gave everything. He wanted me to give. He gave things here. He wanted me to give stuff to the Space and Rocket Center. So a lot of my stuff is at the Space and Rocket Center, but not the pictures. I never got around to making uh, copies to distribute, so I will make those and bring those in, too. Oh, that would be very nice. Uh, if you bring the originals, we can scan them easily here. Of course, you have equipment to scan them, yeah. too, I guess. No, I'll just bring you what I've got. I'll make copies of what I want to keep and bring you the rest of it. Because y'all have a better use for it than me just keeping, I just want to keep some that I, you know, copies of what I like, and then you can have those and all the rest well, of the originals. That that's I very, very kind of you. I'm delighted for them to have a place. Yes, well, they'll be here yeah. forever, I yeah. guess, or yeah. <laughs> thereabouts. Yeah, because I really love Dr. Herman. He, he was so supportive of students. He was so interested in everybody being, enjoying astronomy and being, <clears throat> part of the beauty of the night sky, that he made me love it even more than I did anyway. He was so, I mean, one time he tried to show me Pluto, and I have absolutely horrible eyesight. And he said, do you see this? And do you see this? And I said, yes. He said, now, the light that's just below that second is Pluto. He said, do you see that? And I said, no, sir. He said, it's all right. This was after about four times. He said, the light from Pluto's, the light from Pluto has fallen into your eye, and you have seen it, even if your brain hasn't registered it. He says, you have seen the light of Pluto. That's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was like that. Um, he was charming. He was a ladies' man. Yes. He wasn't above kissing your hand sometimes. He loved to walk in the forest. Uh, we'd meet him on, when we go up to the mountain a lot, uh, we would meet them sometimes. He and his wife would be out for a walk in the forest. He just loved it. And he practically skipped along. He was so enthusiastic about life. Mm -hmm. He loved to play the piano and was really sad when he couldn't play anymore because of his heart problems. Um, 
it was that and the violin was it was just too too difficult for him. Wouldn't get rid of the piano though; it stayed in the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, he he inspired me to study harder and to work harder in astronomy. He actually worked on a project with me. I got a grant to look at science, technology, and the humanities because there are very few of us who have a background in science and humanities. And that's one thing I do have in my background, as many courses in one as in the other, and just more of the advanced courses in history. So um, he helped me with that. And I do remember when I told Dr. White, who's the chairman of the history department, that I was going to use him, he said, that old Nazi, well, all right. But I never found Dr. Hermann to be a bigot in any way about Jews. In fact, in my class we had a Jewish student. He never treated him any different. When the few times we talked about it, he said it was it was what I did, it was what I was supposed to do, it was my country. And I supported my country. He said, I don't support killing people or damaging people or picking out people for no really good reason mm -hmm. to hate. He said, I never realized how bad it was. I don't think most of us did. And of course, he knew about Midford. I'm sure he did. I don't remember if he talked about that or not. But I feel sure he might have gone there. Of course, his, he mainly was at uh, Penamunda in Berlin. He went to Berlin a lot. Yeah, he, he wasn't so involved, as I understand it, in the production of the V2 as he was in the... No aerodynamics yeah. of it and so Wind forth. Tunnel. Yes, he the wasn't testing. He wasn't no. a production engineer at no, all. No, no. And I don't know. He <laughs> never mentioned that he went there. And but I forgot to may ask. Not have. And I forgot to even He may not have had any reason to go there. Mm -hmm. Probably very busy doing his aerodynamics. Oh, yeah, he was. But he was, he was good at explaining what happened. I mean, I can still see him talking about them running when the, the Allied forces bombed Penamunda. And he and his family are running through the falling debris and fire to get, you know, to some safety. He talked about the Russian prisoners that were there. <clears throat> he, he never refused to answer my questions except once. And it was, he made me turn the recorder off. It was actually about his wife, his first wife. He, he cherished very warm feelings for his first wife, and he never wanted there to be any kind of, uh, I don't even remember the question I was going to ask him, what it could possibly be, but he, he didn't want his children offended. He didn't want to, I know what it was, he didn't want to talk about his second wife because he didn't want to offend his children. Um, he, he always went around and helped his first wife. If she needed something fixed or something done, he trotted right over there. They lived, you know, with just in a few blocks of each other. And he kept up, as far as I know, an amiable uh, relationship with her. So she was a historian, was she not? Yes, an art historian. And they met at school together. And she was brilliant. And he really was drawn to her because her mind was such a wonderful mind. His second marriage, she was passionate. Extremely passionate woman, colorful. My father called her the Duchess. Uh, beautiful, uh, extraordinarily beautiful woman. And, and an artist. And an artist. Mm -hmm. So he's still pulling the art. Yeah, I've, I've seen her paintings and other yeah. things. Yeah, but he was very, very concerned about his children's feelings. And that, that um, so he didn't really want to talk about his second wife much. I think there's, I'll check the notes. If there's stuff isn't in there about her, I will write in what I remember he told me about it. He was very proud of his children. He thought a great deal of them. He was closer to, I think, the first two uh, because he had more leisure when they were young to actually spend some time with them. But he was fiercely proud of his children and how well they'd done in life. What did he have to say about the process of coming to the United States? Did he comment on that? Well, he was he was interested. He he certainly didn't want to fall into the Russians' hands, and that's you know was they thought a real possibility. So he was ready and willing to go, so he could pursue his work. 
and he saw no way that staying in Germany that he would be able to. So I guess he first went to the Air Force Research yes. Facility. Yes, he went to the Air Force right, Patterson. Right, right Patterson. Right Patterson, yeah. yeah. Stayed yeah. there for several years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he came down here next, I think. No, he, no, went, he went somewhere he, I think else. he I went to the University of Minnesota. Oh, okay. He was a professor and uh, mm -hmm. Um, leader of the wind tunnel work at the University of Minnesota mm -hmm. and was hired from there to come here, here. in about 1961. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've actually visited the laboratory where he was in, oh, in, wow. in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It's now pretty much an overgrown uh, mm -hmm. area, but I saw the building that was where the wind tunnel was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things he and I talked about on that project of science um, and the humanities that a lot of people did not seem to understand. Um, <clears throat> I remember we talked about terrorism, although it was very early. It was in the, this happened in the oh, 70s, early 80s, and um, he, early 80s, and some of the uh, historians couldn't make the scientists understand that they dismiss, were dismissive of terrorism. And the historians, but Dr. Herrmann wasn't. He knew that if you have a fanatic, you got problems. You don't dismiss fanaticism. And, but that was really interesting that the, that the historians, because they study humans, were much more knowledgeable about that and the scientists were much more naive, but Dr. Herman knew. Who were his associates that you ran into, or did you run into any of his associates? Oh, well, basically, it was the men who came to the Astronomical Society okay. Gert and Dr. Stuhlinger and Mr. Angela. Mainly, those guys were, were at the, they came regularly to the, to the yeah, Angela built the place oh. almost sent me off for concrete. Instead of concrete, he wanted me to get Portland cement, sand, and I don't know, whatever. And when I went, I said, you know, do I, is there anything else I need? He says, why don't you just get cement? I said, is that the same thing? He said, yes, you're getting the ingredients for cement. So I said, oh, um, concrete. And I said, okay, I'll take that. I took it back. Hmm. He was okay with it. <laughs> he sometimes wasn't okay if you didn't obey what he said to <laughs> <laughs> but he was, I mean, he wanted to mix it up from scratch, but I thought, we have so much to do, we do not need to mix it up from scratch. And he would climb, Lord, that Mr. Angela would climb anywhere. In his 80s, he was climbing all over the building and everywhere. And we couldn't stop him, we tried. When did you last see Dr. Ehrman? Let me think. It wasn't long before he died. In fact, I was supposed to I was leaving for France, along with Dr. Dr. Stilling was on the same plane just in front of me, and we were leaving that morning to go overseas when we heard he died. But I saw him off and on right up until he died, and I did see him grow weaker. When he could not eat anymore and had to use the feeding tube, there was a marked decline in his... <clears throat> energy levels, because this man was energetic. He really was an energetic man. Had a great zest for life and for learning, and but by the time he got to that point, even with his heart problems, he just, you know, he kept on. But this made a big difference. I remember one time we were at his uh, wife's daughter's house, the McCormick house, and uh, his wife's grandson was eating with Dr. Herman and I, and the other adults had already gone, and the kid didn't like what he was eating. And he spit it out across the floor, hit the wall. And I yanked him up and paddled him right there. Said, Don't you ever do that again. Dr. Herman calmly kept eating, didn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> Were you at his 80th anniversary party? Yes, I was. And I failed to make the toast. I, I'm not used to champagne. And after a couple glasses of champagne, I couldn't think as clear as I'd like to, and they wanted toasts. And I would have liked to have said, uh, uh, given a toast to him because he came, the, the town he came from not only produced Dr. Herman, but it 
produce the reunification. And so I thought that was a, a wonderful thing. Two wonderful products from the same town. <laughs> and I, I didn't get to do that. <laughs> that was also at the McCormick House, as I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what other things have I not asked about that you'd like to mm. mention? Well, uh, if you need to know, uh, his son-in-law uh, was James Reeves, and he's still in town, works for the government. Uh, his daughter-in-law is still in town, uh, Marion Reeves. His grandson uh, is, uh, I think, in Florida, Cedric Reeves. Uh, and they don't have the McCormick House anymore. So. Anything else? No, just that I thought he was a wonderful fellow. He really was. Well, we surely thank you for coming in today and sharing your experiences with us and recording that for posterity mm -hmm. so that people a hundred years from now will yeah. know what you thought of. Well, if anybody ever has to be him, they should be slender and charming and have twinkling blue eyes. <laughs> That's a good way to end the conversation. Thank you very much. You're welcome.